Well, let's begin with, uh, with prayer in these Christmas days. We'll uh, take our time to, to celebrate. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, amen. amen. Almighty God, you have poured into our hearts the true light of your incarnate word. Grant that this light may shine forth in our lives through the same Jesus Christ, your Son, our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. Okay, we had uh, stuck our big toe uh, into chapter 45 where uh, uh, Joseph finally uh, drops his Egyptian mask, much to the... Uh, a little bit of horror of, or uh, uh, gasping uh, sighs of his uh, brothers who are trying to wrap their mind around this. After this series of tests, we, were, uh, uh, we, we saw Joseph's plan unfolding that would, uh, uh, after a couple of back and forths, to, uh, to ensure that Benjamin would come down to see him in, uh, uh, in Egypt. And uh, testing the brothers... Uh, uh, to the point where finally uh, you have the, uh, the, the, the moment where he says, I am Joseph. And uh, it's probably just in terms of reviewing that again, those just the first couple of uh, verses there in chapter 45, with, uh, uh, where it talks about uh, where Joseph could not control himself. I mean, think of the emotion uh, in that moment. I mean, he knows, and he's known the whole time, and in months have passed. I mean, the trips back and forth have passed, and then when they come back again, and uh, the the sit down with Judith, or excuse me, Judah. After I was looking at you, Judith, I be <laughs> kind of threw me. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, where Judah, you know, he he sees this this uh, change in his brothers. They they are not the same men. Uh, he's been looking for uh, you know the, the the marks of repentance. Uh, and uh, where Judah finally you know, stands up and says, you know, you know take me, I, I've given my word to my father. You know, there's a concern, the great love for Jacob, not lying to Jacob there anymore, uh, as they had. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, and the brothers not being vindictive about, uh, you know, Benjamin, why would you put the cup, uh, the, the, you know, the master's cup in your bag? Well, you know, they, they, there's no accusations, there's just this mystery and wonder at all of this until that moment as Joseph finally sees the brothers uh, where he uh, sends everybody out. And this is interesting. You wonder about the, 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 the dynamic, the human dynamic, because there are other you know, Egyptian attendants there, but this is a moment that's going to be between Joseph and his brothers who don't know that it's Joseph yet until he tells them. But, but there in the first couple verses there that uh, uh, you know, make everyone go out uh, from me, uh, uh, so no one stays in there. Uh, 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 when Joseph made himself known to his brothers, when he finally reveals himself, and this is almost like a uh, uh, this. It's, it's kind of a try to understand the way I'm saying this because we've been making the point of of seeing Joseph and this whole account, which is a pretty huge account in the book of Genesis, as a as a picture of. Jesus, a type of Jesus. Now, Joseph is not Jesus, and yet we've seen so many things, you know, from the, from the you know, when, when he sends his brothers back and say, tell my father, uh, our father, that, that I am alive, uh, uh, you know, and that uh, you, you can go back and in a, in a matter of speaking, they could say, uh, Joseph is risen, <laughs> Joseph is raised, because we, we all thought he was dead, but he's not dead. He, in fact, he rules uh, very much in the same way, of course, a much larger way, where Jesus is raised. The one who was thought to be dead is risen. And uh, he's not, uh, Jesus is not second in command after Pharaoh, like Joseph is, but Jesus rules. A lot of these parallels, and Jesus always takes it up, uh, that's the way it is with a type and a, what we call an anti-type. Jesus is the anti-type. He's always, you're, you're similar to the type, he's similar to Joseph, but no, nah, no, nah, you're not the same. It takes it up a notch. And we've seen a lot of these things, and we'll, we'll see a few more of these. But, uh, uh, but, you know, Joseph weeps aloud, I mean, the emotion of this moment, and then uh, 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 says to his brothers, I'm Joseph, uh, is my father still alive? A question that he had asked before when they came back uh, on this trip. And uh, 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 the, uh, 
you know, and the, here the brothers are so, you know, absolutely bewildered and wondering at what's going on here uh, that suddenly this Egyptian man, who apparently can speak their language and understand their language, and he calls them in closer, and after t saying who he is, which they have to feel a bit of distress from that as their mind goes to what they had done, their own sin, things that they had been carrying with them in their conscience all these years, whether frequent or not, it was something they knew that they were aware of, and that sticks. We have that same experience with things on our conscience. And here is a, you know, the relief of that conscience in such a, in such a gracious way, because Joseph, although he does mention to them that, uh, where does he say that, uh, 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 yeah, in verse, uh, the middle of verse 4, when uh, he has his brothers come near and he says, I'm your brother. You know, I'm not dead, like you may have thought I was. I'm your brother Joseph, um, whom you sold into Egypt. And he doesn't say whom you sold. I mean, we're, we're not in the room, and all we have are the words recorded for us by Moses through the Holy Spirit. And it's, it's like he's sent all the Egyptians out. There's almost like a, a guarding of the brother's reputation for what they've done. He's going to show mercy to them. So the point is, he does say, you sold me into Egypt. But that's not the point of this now. And I've sent all the other Egyptians out. So the Egyptians who could say, uh, of all of these brothers, you know, Joseph, can you hear yourself? These are the men who, who sold you into slavery and had all these other things that followed on uh, for your suffering and the trials and the troubles that you endured all these years. And even here, it's almost like Joseph is I mean, he's confronting them still. But he's seen their repentance, their change of heart, their actions towards Benjamin, whom they don't hate, and their father, who they are you know, kindly disposed towards. And it's almost as he is like protecting their reputation. He'll, he'll mention the fact that you sold me into Egypt. That happened. And then this whole description of God meaning it for good. And this is really, this is, I remember, you know, one of, the, one of the great proof texts. Here's another, uh, I don't know if I showed this one last time. Uh, uh, we'll talk a little bit more about it. It picks up with the, the actual singling out of Benjamin again. And even there, you know, when Joseph gathers in, you know, he kind of falls on Benjamin's neck, meaning just this, you know, they're, they're weeping. They're, they're embracing, they're kissing uh, after all of this time. It, it, this is a moment of, uh, you know, outpoured compassion and love and mercy. And the brothers aren't even... Though they may be painted here as going, hmm, what, what's going on here? Or do you think he's going to snap? Do you think he's going to come back and attack us and be vindictive and punish us? Because make no mistake, just like Jesus, is Jesus within his rights to punish us for our sin? Jesus most certainly could because he is just. And Joseph, all the Egyptians in that room before he sends them out would, would, uh, would not question Joseph's authority as the second in command in uh, Pharaoh's Egypt to have his brothers executed because of what his brothers did. But of course he doesn't. And again, here's again a, a, a whiff, a picture of this mercy of God, which we know only in Christ Jesus, but we, all, we know only in Christ Jesus because Joseph in history preserved, well, God through his definite plan, through Joseph and through all of the sinful activities and terrible things that happened to him intentionally and even unintentionally, God caused a remnant, a pretty small nucleus of people, uh, to be preserved. And that was even just one part of Israel's history or the, the Old Testament church's history, which is really your history and my history too. That's, uh, there's a, a passage of time but in terms of the things that God had did there, that was for you. When God is feeding extra grain to uh, the people from all these other nations that would come to Egypt because they had the foresight uh, to, to save seven years of grain uh, for, the, with, for the fat cows to, that are going to get eaten up by the, the skinny cows. And God preserves his people. God keeps his promise. Always has the, the big picture, far more expansive than what we think we see. And behind all of this, I mean, you hear me talk, uh, and I know we've talked in other uh, classes with other topics about uh, uh, you know, this, this phrase, the theology of the cross. Uh, and that's a term Luther would use 
uh, for a, a set of theses he did that kind of came to kind of crystallize Lutheran theology, a theology of the cross versus its, its uh, opposite, or even its nemesis, a theology of glory. Now, glory sounds good. Glory sounds glorious. But a theology, a theology of glory is terrible. Theology of glory says, uh, I look around, and uh, if things seem to be looking good to me, then as I perceive or think things, then I guess God likes me. Maybe because of what I did. Maybe because of my good works. Maybe because my heart is purer than yours. That's just what I think. But that's a theology of glory. That's a, that's a damnable theology. There's no hope. It might help you uh, dog paddle a while with a bad conscience, but uh, it's nothing to cling to. But what is our theology? Well, what does St. Paul say? We preach Christ and him crucified. crucified. Our theology is the cross, where the idea there is that, uh, you know, I mean, this might, I don't want to oversimplify it, but it really, it is kind of simple to ask what's true. We should all be interested in what's true. And uh, if the, well, hopefully if we've learned through our own life experience and, and uh, uh, even uh, 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 the, the, the things that have gone on uh, around us for some time that what's true is not necessarily what you think or what you see, or what you take in by your perceptions, what's true is going to be what God says. So the theology of the cross doesn't uh, run by how we perceive things. I mean, the, the great example of the, uh, of the crucified one, if I just look at this, does this look glorious? A, a man, a Jewish man dying on a cross between two other men? Well, what, what, do, what do I think if I stumble across this? <clears throat> I might think, uh, glad I'm not him, or he must be pretty bad. You know, are those true things? Well, maybe the, the idea that I'm glad I'm not him. <laughs> but uh, the, I only know that this is the most important event in history because God reveals it in his word and says, I so love the world, I give up my beloved. What I love most in order that I might have you, my, my fallen creation, return to me. And with joy and mercy and forgiveness, I'm the, the, the prodigal son's father looking down the road ready to really uh, 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 un, 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 unbecomingly run, you know, hike up my skirts and run down to greet you after you took all my money and wished I was dead and went off to a far country and squandered everything. And the father's heart is, my son is alive. He was dead, but now he's alive. But looking at the cross, with the theology of the cross, and you say, oh, that's God's son. The eternal God took on flesh, the incarnate God. And now there he is dying for me. He is the lamb of God. He's God's lamb. That's sacrificial, bloody language. And he's the lamb of God, and he's taking away the sin, my sin, your sin, but the sin of the world. And so, you know, behind all of that, when, when we see glimpses of, uh, uh, of Jesus in the story of Joseph, and we'll, we'll point out a couple more of those as well, but the, uh, the, the, the language of, uh, 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 in verses 4 through 8, uh, look at how many times, well, like, what, so, could someone read 4 through 8 again? Let's just have this ahead of us. We, we looked at this briefly at the end of last, last, last year, but... Uh, Before we go um, into that... It just kind of struck me um, when you said that he was protecting their reputation, the brothers Joseph was. Well, um, Jesus kind of did that too with Peter. When yeah. he, it seemed like he at least pulled him aside and assured him of his love and forgiveness and then told him what to do next. Feed my lambs. Yeah, my yeah. Sheep. And um, how I'm sure Jesus longed to do the same thing for Judas. Yeah, yeah, and and not dismissing the real the real betrayal, the real denial. I mean, those are damnable sins, uh, uh, and and yet exactly. I mean, he still, you know, when we talk about the eighth commandment, you know, that we you know defend our neighbor's name and reputation. But you're right. That's exactly right. Because Jesus fulfills the commandment for us, and he he guards my reputation. Which, uh, you know, you might, I might have my public reputation, which I really care about because I don't want people to think I'm a jerk. I don't want you to know all that much about, you know, my proclivities or my sin, my pet sins, or the things I excuse myself for. And, and yet, God brings me to repentance, 
God shows me grace, and he also doesn't drag my name around when he really could. <laughs> Look at that guy. But that's, you know, or even, you know, as, as we'll see here, Joseph doesn't, you know, when he sends his brothers back to get dad and says, don't tarry, you know, hurry up, go, I got a plan. I've been thinking about this. I want you here with me in Goshen, you know, down the road in Goshen. I'm going to take care of you, the, the little remnant. And there's a lot more that's going to happen to Israel, you know, before God is done, part of his definite plan. But he doesn't, you know, one thing he never says to his brothers, uh, he doesn't ever say, now you go back to dad. And you tell our father Jacob exactly what you did. You know, and there, even there, it's sort of a, he knows what they did. And we talked about, did Jacob know what the, the, his uh, sons did? There's a couple clues here and there that, you know, because his, his uh, sons didn't have, you know, Simeon and Levi go you know, kill the neighbors. Uh, uh, Judah uh, has an uh, uh, incestuous relationship with uh, uh, one of his uh, 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 with uh, uh, one of the, the daughters-in-law. Uh, uh, you know, there's other activities that are going. You know, one of the other sons has a child with uh, one of uh, Abraham's uh, uh, what with uh, Billo or uh, uh, one of the other two, not Rachel or Leah. But you know, it's not a great group of guys. And uh, you know, we, we kind of as we paid attention to the text. Uh, uh, you, you always wondered, uh, like when Simeon was still left as the, the one captive holdout, where he doesn't even mention, <laughs> Jacob never mentioned Simeon by name, you know, and not to read too much into that, but did Jacob has, have his suspicions? Probably he knew the nature of his sons. Did he know anything definite? You know, we don't know that he did, but there's enough caution that he probably thought, these are my boys and they're not a, not a great group of people. And, uh, uh, and yet here, I mean, Joseph is like leaving, he's acknowledging it. I'm, I'm your brother that you sold into slavery. Go get dad. He's like, he runs past that. He leaves that in the past because this broken relationship, this, this dead relationship uh, has been restored. Could, you know, close that door. Um, thanks, Diana. They're going to be heading into the uh, choir room there. But, uh, but, but this language, and could someone read uh, Genesis 45, verses 4 to 8, and look especially, listen for the language of, uh, uh, of Joseph describing uh, uh, what God is doing and how he, uh, uh, and, and what, he, what he means when he, when he talks about who's doing the doing here. Who's doing all the verbs behind these hateful, nasty things. So Joseph said to his brothers, come near to me, please. And they came near. And he said, I am, Joseph, I am your brother Joseph, whom you sold into Egypt. And now do not be distressed or angry with yourselves because you sold me here. For God sent me before you to preserve life. For the famine has been in the land these two years, and there are yet five years in which there will be neither plowing nor harvest. And God sent me before you to preserve for you a remnant on earth and to keep alive for you many survivors. So it was not you who sent me here, but God. He has made me a father to Pharaoh and Lord of all his house, and ruler over all the land of Egypt. Okay, that's good. Thank you, Davis. I mean, what a confession. That, uh, uh, you know, it was not you who sent me here, but God. I mean, look at, look at the, 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 uh, the end of verse 5. You know, for God sent me before you. Uh, then at the verse 7, and God sent me before you, as if to you know, emphasize this. Uh, or at uh, you know, verse 8, so it was not you who sent me here, but God. I mean, that's really incredible. That's not, and that's not Joseph just you know, putting the best construction on everything, which we are bidden to do. And that's part of you know, uh, 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 keeping our mouths shut about other people when we, when we don't have the place to speak or judge, certainly judge them, uh, and at other times having to speak truthfully about even bad things. But the, uh, I mean, here is, uh, you know, Joseph is able to see past, past, he's in the room with his brothers, 
who, he, uh, he's the guy who had a vantage point from down in a, uh, a pit, down in a dry well, where he could see you know, the, the snarling faces of his brothers. And as he cried out, they just left him there. You know, just <coughs> absolute treachery and evil. Uh, and then selling him. Uh, he's the one who you know, was uh, uh, the, the Potiphar's wife trying to seduce him. And then after she doesn't get her way, well, her plan B is to destroy Joseph by falsely accusing him. So now he goes to prison for things that he did not do. In fact, he didn't, he wasn't, I mean, he was tempted to do it, but he actually said, no, you know, how can I do this great, th this sin against God and against my, my master who gives me the run of the whole house and all things, but not you. You are not my wife. You have not been given to me, but, but everything else has been. Or, the, or that cupbearer, you know, the cupbearer who gets the good interpretation of the dream that he's going to be reinstalled uh, to service to the Pharaoh. Uh, and the, uh, uh, and uh, what does Joseph ask the cupbearer to do? Yeah, 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 hey, when you get a chance. And the cupbearer's like, oh, yeah, yeah. And we talked about uh, whatever the motivations behind that were out of fear or time passes. or But he does, you know, finally make mention. Maybe he, didn't make, maybe he makes mention to Pharaoh about this dream interpreter uh, uh, when, it, you know, when he thinks he can advance from it, even out of selfish motives. But you know, all of these folks, and I tell you, uh, who has eaten the grain that uh, through God's definite plan uh, uh, that was preserved by Joseph? Well, his brothers are. And, and uh, Potiphar's wife, she still gets to eat. She still gets to benefit from this one whom she uh, uh, falsely accused. The cupbearer uh, has, uh, you know, he, he's able to hold a cup to help wash down whatever meal they're making for Pharaoh because there's grain to make something and Pharaoh can eat it and wash it down with, uh, uh, with whatever wine is in the, the master's cup. But it's, you know, all of them intended evil against uh, Joseph uh, or you know, permitted evil just to go on, and yet God worked that. In, in one sense, that's all God has to work with. He just has us and, and material like us to work through. And yet God, with, an, with, with no cliche behind this, the fact that God worked it for good. And uh, I was, uh, th this is kind of familiar with, uh, I, I loved it's been kind of fun. Here we've been looking at Genesis 37 through the end of the book of Genesis, and that's been kind of our focus. And yet still we, we spent some time in Psalm 105, which had like a whole subsection about Joseph, you know, when he was in uh, chains, and yet he was elevated by, by Pharaoh and got to teach the uh, Egyptians, you know, God doing it. That's a long psalm, and in the middle of Psalm 105, is, as God is narrating our story, he is... Uh, 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 spending some time on what Joseph was doing. Well, here, I, I love the, uh, the, the mention, because it's similar to what Joseph says here. In Acts chapter 2, this is the Pentecost Day sermon. This is uh, Peter lifting up his voice and saying this is in the midst of uh, the much longer uh, sermon by the chapter. But look at this language, because it's, again, it's the same thing. It's, it's a different thing, but it's the same thing. About God's definite plan. Men of Israel, hear these words. So, still hear these words. God speaks to us with words, words that can be understood, which, by which He gives understanding. Jesus of Nazareth, that man, ah, a man attested to you by God, by what? By mighty works which you saw, and wonders and signs that God did through Him in your midst. You know, you are without excuse, O oh man. You yourselves know this. This Jesus, and look at this language, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God. Or you make it shorter. Jesus, delivered up by God. By the definite plan, by the definite foreknowledge of God. This is God's doing. Where he even takes what people intend for evil. We had this conversation a couple weeks ago where uh, I think, you know, you know th th this is not permission to, oh, let's, let's sin. 
that grace may abound. Let me find something really evil and hateful to do, and we'll see how God works it out for you. You know, you know may it never be, as Paul says in, in Romans 9, where that whole uh, conversation takes place. And yet, here is, uh, uh, you know, what greater human evil has ever been perpetrated than by mankind when God sends his son in the flesh uh, to his own and his own receive him not. And, and as Peter could point to the, the, the crowd there in Jerusalem, still, you know, 50 days after the Passover and, and, and the, the few days after that with the resurrection, and to say, this happened right in front of you. Here's a theology of the cross. Let me tell you exactly what all of that meant with all of these events. You hear that Jesus of Nazareth is raised, that, that comes as a later part of this sermon. Uh, uh, that's one of the witnessed works of God as well. Yeah, he was, by the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, he's crucified. We mocked him. We spit on him. We rejected the Savior of the world, who came nonetheless. For God so loves the world, you know, while, while we were yet godless, while we were yet disobedient, while we were enemies of God. I and mean, here is the love of God played out, and we would only know it because a theology of the cross. God must tell us in his word. God tells us through his son what is happening. And so just as in the kind of the microcosm picture, although it's part of the big picture, Joseph can say, no, no, you didn't send me here. I'm not here because of you. Don't, in fact, don't be angry or distressed. Uh, don't be distressed or angry to yourselves. Because he understands there that they're thinking, oh my gosh, you know, uh, this could... <laughs> We, what we did to Joseph, we did to Joseph. And, and, and uh, uh, there's got to be a payment for that. Well, no. That's been wiped away. That has been you know, nailed to the cross, so to speak. That God sent me. God did this. That is incredible and joyous news. Because it still stands for all of us through, through the, the sermon that Peter is preaching here. It really is just... Just remarkable. The, you know, we, we talk about that kinship between Joseph and, and Jesus. Uh, uh, and, uh, 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 you know, here, <laughs> this is a pretty pointed sermon. I don't know if, you, if Peter could preach this in too many churches today in the way it was delivered to say, as he's pointing to the people who are right there in the city, and to say, you, you did this, is, this, is, this is good law. <laughs> this is law that's, because, you know, you crucified and killed. You know, by the hands of lawless men. You know, Rome helped. You know, the, the, the Sanhedrin helped. Uh, all of our sins upon him are, is the reason he did it. And yet he came to do this. And of course, how Peter's sermon ends when it says the people hearing this are cut to the heart. And, uh, and what are they, you know, what shall we do? Uh, no, no, it's not going to be up to you to do. Repent and receive a gift. Be baptized. God is the one who baptizes you for the forgiveness of your sins. And this is for you. It's for your children, too. I mean, the, the entire uh, uh, counsel of God is part of this and replayed over and over again, whether we're in Genesis or in the Psalms, certainly in the Gospels or in the, in the book of Acts. Um, there was one other, uh, once I saw this, uh, uh, this kind of connection here in, in Peter's sermon, I was also struck by, I think this is really kind of, kind of sweet, because uh, I had kind of forgotten this. And you forget all the different strings that are attached uh, uh, that show, you know, the Old and New Testament not as, you know, different books, but of all the, the you know, different testaments, and yet a united book with one author, you know, uh, the Holy Spirit working through Moses and Isaiah and Matthew and, and uh, John and Paul. Uh, here, Acts chapter 7, again, this is much a part, if you remember, this is you know, after the resurrection of our Lord, uh, uh, and there's trouble for the disciples in the, uh, uh, they get arrested and roughed up uh, uh, in, in Jerusalem, and uh, here Stephen, Acts chapter 7, uh, that whole long chapter is another long sermon. We just looked at Acts chapter 2, Peter's sermon. Well, here's part of a, we could spend a lot of time on, on uh, the entire sermon, but even this big chunk, this is all about, this is a nice review of what we've been talking about for the last couple of months. Another uh, New Testament sermon. And what's the result of, uh, how, is, 
How is Stephen Sermon greeted here? Did he get a Did he get a raise? I can't remember. Did they get a parsonage allowance and uh, they they put him to death? But listen to this. This is and I I highlighted a couple things uh, uh, at the moment I was first reading this. So there there might be other things if you see things to comment on. But uh, uh, let me let me read this. So uh, you know, Christ is risen. Hallelujah. And now here's another, you know, we just celebrated Stephen's martyrdom day, according to church custom. What is that, uh, uh, December 28th? You know, there's St. John, no, John, John is the 28th, Holy Innocence so the 29th, maybe, uh, maybe Stephen is the uh, 27th. But there's three days right in a row there, right in the middle of Christmas time, and you've got the slaughter of the innocents, the children of Bethlehem. You've got Stephen, the, the first adult martyr, and then you've got John nudged in between there as the only one who isn't martyred, uh, as far as we know, but, uh, uh, the, the uh, apostle and evangelist. But here, listen to this. I love this detail because, I don't know, could, could I preach this this Sunday? Would the people of God at, at St. Paul's know enough about God's word and how God worked in the Old Testament through the patriarchs and with Abraham and with circumcision. All the stuff that's mentioned here, I've kind of focused it here on the Joseph part of the story. But this is a Christian sermon. And we probably do well to ask ourselves, you know, would I get it? I mean, I had to go look. I mean, I, I guess I've known this is in the Bible. And yet I was looking in, uh, uh, as I was looking up another reference, I go, gosh, there's this whole huge section where Stephen, you know, as he's about to be put to death, He's preaching about Old Testament Israel, and, and, and Joe, he has a lot to say about Joseph, as if that's kind of an important part of the story of our salvation. Well, here it is. Uh, God, and it goes, there's more stuff about Abraham before this. I'm just trying to focus it on the, the Joseph narrative, that Genesis 37 stuff that's been our kind of Joseph and Genesis study here. God gave Abraham the covenant of circumcision. And here, what did we do on January 1st? Well, we saw how, we, we remembered how Jesus, uh, the eternal Son of God who becomes man, he too uh, is put, puts himself in that, circum, circ, that covenant of circumcision and, and begins to shed his blood for us as an eight-day-old child as we celebrate the, the uh, circumcision and the name of Jesus. So Abraham became the father of Isaac and circumcised him on the eighth day day. And Isaac became the father of Jacob, check, check, and Jacob of the 12 patriarchs, just names them all the fathers, patriarchs. And the patriarchs, now here's, the, here's what we've been looking at the past couple of months. Jealous of Joseph, sold him into Egypt, check, but God was with him. Remember, even in that, uh, uh, was it Genesis 39, where he, he's in prison, and that, that, that Phrase that's kind of repeated three times, pretty pretty close to itself. You know, but the Lord was with Joseph. But the Lord was with Joseph. And in the midst of your hellish trials and trouble, no, no, you're not alone. You, you feel alone. That's but a theology of the cross says, no, no, the Lord is with me. How do I know that? Because He says He is. Lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Where two or three are gathered in My name, there am I. This is my body. This is my blood given and shed for you. There am I. But God was with Joseph and rescued him out of all his afflictions, gave him favor and wisdom before Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who made him ruler over Egypt and over all his household. You know, we're just kind of confirming everything that Genesis has been uh, telling us. Uh, now there came a famine throughout all Egypt and Canaan. So Egypt and then uh, up, up north, but probably... Was it a worldwide famine? We talked about that. The, the idea is that, at least in that area, nothing's growing. Uh, Egypt and Canaan, uh, and great affliction, and our fathers could find no food. Verse 12, but when Jacob heard that there was grain in Egypt, he sent out our fathers. You know, remember Stephen is you know, speaking about the patriarchs, the brothers of uh, uh, Joseph, the sons of Jacob, as our fathers in the family on their first visit. So he, he's kind of cataloging. This is a nice review for us uh, uh, first time back in uh, uh, 2023. Uh, and on the second visit, Joseph made himself known to his brothers, and Joseph's family became known to Pharaoh. In fact, they were going to move down. 
And Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred, 75 persons. Now, in the big scheme of things, I mean, there's the, there's the, the 12 sons of Jacob. Uh, 75 doesn't sound like an enormous family. And yet, as, we'll, as we know, as you know already, this number is it's just a, a remnant. Hardly, you know, here's a theology of the cross again. Something that looks insignificant, a weak is going to be the very thing through whom, by which God is going to save the nations. Because through that, in that group of God's people, Israel, you know, not just the man Israel, but his 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 children, his uh, 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 his descendants, and, and Judah and Perez, and going on down the line, in that little nucleus, that little remnant, this small group, insignificant, the world can laugh at their weakness and scoff at how ridiculous it is. Well, what does God say he's going to do through that remnant? He has made a promise to send a savior, a savior for the nations through Abraham. And so the remnant, that's an oft uh, oft repeated word that we find throughout the Old Testament and then picked up uh, in the New Testament to talk about the church. You know, is anybody super impressed by the Christian church in the United States of America? Do you have a place of great honor and standing? People move off to the side of the road because, oh my gosh, those are some of the members of St. Paul's who are coming through after you. Can I do anything? No. I mean, you are, we are looked upon with like sneering disgust, uh, believers in uh, silly old uh, uh, fiction tales. And you know, we don't want to actually talk about it with you, but uh, you believe stupid things like a, like a virgin birth or a, a dead man rising. And they go, yeah, I, I, and I believe all of those things, not because I'm smarter than anyone, but because God has done it. God has spoken it. And God has revealed it in his word. And I believe those things. Not be, again, you know, faith comes by hearing. Hearing a word that, was, that came from outside of me, came outside of you, but for you. And the Holy Spirit working through his word creating faith. But we're that remnant, you know, that, uh, yeah, he also calls us a, a, a holy priesthood, uh, a kingdom of, uh, uh, of priests. Uh, but boy, the world kind of laughs because you don't, you don't look, we don't look great. I don't mean, you, don't, you guys look great today, let me say that. But as a church, no one, uh, uh, you know, at this moment in culture, the church certainly doesn't have the, uh, uh, hold any the, the place that it might formerly had in other times. But even then, when the, the church, uh, you know, in, look back in history, when the church was powerful, you know, when the Pope had an army, was that a theology of the cross? No, <laughs> that was a theology of glory because it looked like the Pope, he, he determined who gets to be king. You know, he was the one who gets to do the coronation. If the Pope puts the, 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 uh, 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 the, the crown on your head, then you're good. So it was kind of a big deal when Napoleon, when he was getting crowned, he, he took the, the crown out of the, the, the church guy's hands and he, he crowned himself because he's making a statement saying, I don't need you. You're, you're worthless to me. Uh, and of course, the, uh, the church in Rome and those, or the church in uh, France didn't fare very well during uh, uh, subsequent revolutions. But uh, uh, anyway, the, uh, let, let's go back here. Uh, verse 14. Joseph sent and summoned Jacob, his father, and all his kindred. That's what we'll jump into here. Seventy-five persons in all. In fact, we'll, we'll go to Genesis and have the accounting. And it'll be, there'll be some different numbers out there. And we'll talk about, oh my gosh, which number is it here? There's a, you know, and we'll, we'll, we'll say how it all makes sense. And Jacob went down into Egypt. He, the, the, the land of promise is going to be up there in Canaan. It's still called Canaan. But he's got to come down to Egypt. It won't be until they go back to the promised land after Jacob is long dead. But Jacob's descendants, after they're slaves for how long? 400 some years. I mean, this is just Genesis. There's, there's a lot more to come with God working through his people, a remnant who, who, who often practice idolatry, who don't observe the Sabbath, who neglect his, the hearing of his word, who uh, you know, have their, uh, their, their children go find foreign spouses, all the things God said, don't, don't do that. I'm preserving a, 
a, a remnant, a people here, a holy people, through whom I am going to save the nations. Because I promised already to, in, within Adam and Eve's hearing, that the, the seed of the woman is going to crush the serpent's head. So he will crush the serpent's head. And if the serpent's head gets crushed here, although it doesn't look like the serpent's getting his head crushed, it looks like Jesus of Nazareth is dead on a cross. And that's true. Jesus of Nazareth is dead on the cross, but he is the Son of God, the incarnate Son of God, and by his dying, he takes upon himself and takes away my sin, the sins of the world. And God keeps his promise. Satan screams out because his head is crushed. He still howls a bit and uh, 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 scrounges around looking for a meal, someone to devour, you and me. And yet uh, you don't even have to be afraid because he's judged, the deed is done, and one little word can fell him. God's word. The, uh, anyway, go back to here. I, I keep on digressing. Uh, uh, verse 15, Jacob went down to Egypt, and he died. He and our fathers, and they were carried back to Shechem, back up north, laid in the tomb that Abraham had bought for a sum of silver from the sons of Hamar and Shechem. But as the time of the promise drew near, remember, this is Stephen, after the resurrection of Jesus and the fulfillment of the promise, at the time of the promise drew near, which God had granted to Abraham, the people increased. They started out as 75, and yet how many, uh, I, I can't remember the, the uh, accounting number there, when they finally, after horrible years of slavery, after the appearance that God is not hearing your prayer, and that God doesn't care that you are suffering in slavery, and yet God heard their prayer, and God sent them a savior, a deliverer, not Jesus here, but by the name of Moses. And he brings them out, out of Pharaoh's uh, uh, household now, because uh, uh, there arose over Egypt another king, much further on down the road, who didn't know Joseph. The Pharaoh who knows Joseph, as we're going to see, and this is a great part of the story, and an important part of the story, the Pharaoh who knows Joseph is absolutely thrilled to have Jacob come down and live in their midst. And he's going to take care of me. I'll send wagons. You know, this new technology. I was like, we'll get to this point where, you know, you can read, you can go to heaven without knowing that the fact that Pharaoh supplied wagons and wagons and wagon loads of goods for, for uh, uh, Jacob and his uh, sons uh, and to move them back down. You can, you can go to heaven uh, uh, and, and know the joys of eternity and, and, and the bliss of, of the presence of God without knowing that wagons, I did a little study on this, but this was like new technology for the, for the Egyptians. And so, uh, just like the chariots, you know, that was an Egyptian thing, so much so that the Lord said, my people aren't going to have horses and chariots. To which, as we've talked before, what did God's people then do? What did Solomon do? i got to get me some horses and chariots. <laughs> So uh, that's kind of how that works out. But uh, uh, anyway, let's, uh, let's continue on here. And uh, uh, let's, uh, could someone read verses 9 through 15? Hurry and go up to my father and say to him, Thus says your son Joseph, God has made me Lord of all Egypt. Come down to me, do not tarry. You shall dwell in the land of Goshen, and you shall be near me, and your children and your children's children and your flocks, your herds, and all that you have. There I will provide for you there, for three, for there, but yet five years of famine to come, so that you and your household and all that you have do not come to poverty. And now your eyes see, and the eyes of my brother Benjamin see, and that is my mouth that speaks to you. You must tell my father of all my honor in Egypt, and all that you have seen. Hurry and bring my father down here. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck and wept, and Benjamin wept back upon his neck. And he kissed all his brothers and wept upon them. After that, his brothers talked with him. Okay, thank you, John. Uh, so this, uh, uh, yeah. <laughs> Joseph is risen, apparently, and uh, he rules Egypt. 
go and tell uh, our Father. Uh, sort of a, uh, an echo there of uh, 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 our Lord Jesus Christ's resurrection and the fact that now go and speak what you've seen. Uh, go and tell uh, the disciples that he has risen and we've seen him. Uh, and then that word spreading because this is what God has done right before our eyes in, in our midst. Uh, this, uh, the language, there's a bunch of uh, between... Uh, 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 come down to me, do not tarry, there at the end of verse 9, or, you know, or the beginning of verse 9, hurry! <laughs> uh, uh, or uh, where else is there, uh, uh, at the, the end of verse 13, hurry, bring my father down here. This, this whole, you know, this, uh, uh, you know the, the family is going to be restored and, and brought together here. Uh, this absolute, uh, you know, don't delay, uh, let's get going on this. And it's like, did Joseph have a well thought out plan? about what he's going to, where are we going to put all these people? You know, when we have people in our house, we have, now where, where are the sheets there? we got to change the, the sheets on the bed up there, and uh, uh, now you stay down there, and, and you can sleep on the couch there, and uh, when everybody's home, it's a little more crowded. But, uh, I mean, has Joseph been giving this much thought? Yes. I mean, what are some of the clues there? He, he's found a place for them. They're going to live in Goshen. Right. And, uh, well, Goshen's the best, the best part, part of Egypt. The, uh, yeah, I mean, the, the, uh, there's a Goshen, Indiana. I don't, is that the best part of Indiana? It's uh, <laughs> not far from here. We can have a debate on that. I, I think of the, uh, who's that? The, the pillow guy, my pillow guy, and the, I don't know, the, 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 the cotton sheets that he uses for, for his, uh, for his uh, he always has a picture of like the, uh, the Giza, the Giza, but it's kind of the Goshen area where the, the, the graphic on the commercial is, uh, you know, all these little, Dots of, of cotton where all the good stuff is. But, uh, you know, he's got a, you know, again, to your, to your maps here, we'll, uh, let me see here, we got this probably. Goshen. And I think he's, the, not, I'm not doing a paid advertisement for my pillow, although we got the sheets and we like the sheets. Uh, but now I get like 3,000 emails from him every day. But uh, uh, here's the, the, the delta, but Goshen down here, which, uh, by other non-biblical accounts, uh, I don't know if it's on here, but the city of like uh, Zoan, there were some, the Egyptian royal court was not far from Goshen. So, I mean, Joseph, this is not something like, oh my gosh, this is great, uh, you know, I, I love you guys, and you know, I forgive you, bring dad down here, we'll got, I'll have to find some place for you, it'll take you a couple of weeks to get up there, I'll find some place for you to stay. No, no, he is, this is a thought out plan of this marvelous spot, this real earth place that is going to be for his family. You will... Uh, uh, dwell in the land of Goshen for, for all, all the benefits that that is. Uh, you're going to be close to me. I still have my day job as the uh, uh, second uh, to, to Pharaoh, uh, or as a father and as an advisor to Pharaoh. Uh, uh, now, bring everybody. This is going to be a big move. It's, it's a big enough move to plan a trip from Canaan with all of your uh, uh, animals just to, to, to come and get grain. And then to load them up and then bring them back heavy. You know, that's, that's, that's a challenge already. But now you're going to, you know, it's going to be you and your children, you know, you, my brothers, you know, my, nie my nieces and nephews, uh, your children's children, for the ones who are old enough to have children themselves. And then bring all your flocks, not just the, not just the pack animals. It's an entire move down here, and I've got it set up and established. I mean, it's like your own little, your own little strip of heaven here down in this foreign land. You know, and again here, you know, we, we often see that. Uh, you, you've heard me talk about the promised land or that, that land that God promised to Abraham, uh, which, you know, it's almost as though God is moving his people away from it. You know, why are they going out of Egypt? Well, they're going to come back into that land. Or why does, when he has them in, in uh, Jerusalem, why does he allow uh, uh, the Babylonians to destroy the capital city, you know, much later on, and then take them captivity away from the land. Well, he's going to, in 70 years, bring them right back there, where it speaks about the land, you know, the place where these things happen in history, almost like it's a character. It's as if it's a, a living part of God working through his son and through his creation and by his blood to save sinners. It's really kind of theologically rich 
because this is counterintuitive. If I'm promised the land up here, you know, in Canaan, that's, you know, here's the, the promised land. Okay, move everybody down here. Just this remnant, trust me, I am going to do something from here too. Even after 400 years of slavery, when there's a new Pharaoh who does uh, not know Joseph, you know, where hundreds of years pass and uh, uh, the reputation of Joseph and his family uh, is lost. What are we going to do with all these uh, Hebrews? We'll use them as slaves. We'll overpower them. We'll, uh, you know, we'll, uh, we'll take labor from them. And, you know, does God not know this? Is this not part of God's definite plan? No. No, God knows exactly what he's going to do. And even, you know, later on with the Exodus, when they, they, uh, when they come out and cross the, uh, the Red Sea and they're going to be wandering around here in the Sinai Desert for how long then? 40 40 years. And, uh, and, there, and the Lord said, and Moses said, no, no, go up and take the land. And what are the people, what are, uh, what are the spies they say when they, they go to spy out the land? Oh, it's great stuff there, but what, what's the problem? Full of giants. We look like those, those giants there are going to kill us, so we're not going. You got good Joshua and good Caleb, and they say, no, no, we can do this because it's not us who are going to be doing this thing. God promised this land for us so we can go take what he is giving to us. But the people rebel, and the people, you know, and they don't, even, they don't even celebrate Passover. They don't hear God's word. And they, they wander, and they suffer, and yet, and yet God is still going to keep his promise. You have this promise. You're baptized into this promise, and you have it. This is your God, and he will do what he says he will do. Forgive your sins. Deliver you from death. Uh, salvation is yours as a free gift. Uh, but uh, 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 one other comment here with the uh, so they're coming. Uh, uh, Joseph obviously has uh, he, he makes mention in verse eleven about the uh, we, we kind of know where we are in the famine. They've had the seven good years, save all that grain. Uh, uh, now they're we're two years into the famine, so they're still bad five years. I don't know how your next five years look, but, uh, but God's promise is still in the midst of those years. And uh, 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 so, so you do not come to poverty. So here's Joseph you know, uh, laying out a, a, uh, a completely uh, a way of, of taking care of his family, uh, the, where the threat is you know, dying of starvation, uh, if you, unless you keep on making trips back and forth. But now, no, no, I want you to come close to me, come near to me. Move everybody, not just, you know, make trips twice a year or however often you need to do that in order to bring the grain back up. You'll, you'll be right here where the, where the grain is. And yeah, we are suffering through a famine, but God is providing because God promised uh, and even sent the dreams and the interpreter of dreams to say, this is what I will do. The, the skinny cows, yeah, they're going to eat up the fat cows and the, uh, uh, but uh, 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 God will raise up uh, a Joseph in order to uh, uh, make sure there's enough food. Uh, uh, and then in verse 12, uh, now your eyes see. And again, he mentions, he specifically names Benjamin. Uh, so, and again, this, this love, this brotherly love between Joseph and Benjamin. Uh, and yet, we're not told, but... It, that's good. It's not like uh, that. Uh, we're, we're not told that Joseph, you know, specifically mentioned Benjamin again, uh, and the brothers were getting sick of it because he's always, you know, Benjamin, Benjamin, Benjamin. And yet, no, he's yeah, my brother Benjamin. See, because he's now come down to me, and I see that you don't throw him under the bus. I see that you don't treat him poorly as you once treated his brother, you know, Joseph, me. Uh, uh, and that my mouth that speaks to you. I mean, here's the, you know, the, the one we thought was dead is not dead. Uh, Joseph speaks. Uh, but go, tell my father. Uh, uh, is Joseph being kind of braggadocious here? In verse 13, does that, does that rub anybody the wrong way? Like, uh, oh, no, Joseph has to get it, get it out there. Like, oh, look, look at me. I'm, uh, I'm second... Uh, I'm second in charge of Egypt. You know, no, he, why would he say something like this? Tell my father. He doesn't say, tell my father what you did. 
he, he, doesn't, he guards their reputation there. But he does, why do you think he mentions, or why is it okay for Joseph to say, tell my father of all my honor in Egypt and of all that you have seen, hurry and bring my father down here. What's, I think what, it would be though, because he can more or less has, uh, show that he has the, uh, the authority and can back up what he promised, he can deliver yeah, what he promised. Yeah, he, he's, I mean, I am able to do what I say I will do. I mean, there, there, I think nothing, nothing more than that. I mean, he, uh, uh, even when he says, I'm your brother that you sold into Egypt, he, he passes by that. You know, he mentions it, it's true, but that's not the focal point. The, the restoration and the, the fact that his brothers have, have repented, they are different, and they are shown mercy. The testing is over. Test number one, test number two, test number three, that uh, they must have thought like, oh my gosh, what's going on down here? How does this man know our ages? How does this man uh, uh, know so much about us? Uh, uh, that he, it's almost like he's listening to what we say. Well, he knows your language because he's your brother. Uh, and this marvelous picture, I put this one back up again, uh, 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 verse 14. Then he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck. Again, Benjamin kind of singled out there. I mean, I, I'm sure they're all, uh, I mean, it says they're all, you know, weeping and, and uh, kissing and, and uh, uh, embracing. Uh, but Benjamin is singled out here in the text. Uh, this is his brother by their beloved mother and the, the favorite wife of their father. But he fell upon his brother Benjamin's neck, which is just a uh, kind of, nicely done here in the picture, uh, wept. This isn't, you know, uh, the, the fakey tears or the, the, false, the false emotion. Uh, Benjamin wept upon his neck. He kissed all his brothers. So you kiss Simeon, and you kiss Zebulun, and you kiss Issachar, all those guys, for whatever role that they had played that got him to this point, but all is restored here. Uh, uh, I, am, I am Joseph, your brother. After that, his brothers talk with him. And that fear is taken away. And it'll bubble up again because that's kind of the nature of our, of our conscience. Uh, because after Jacob dies, what's their fear? That he will go against break, uh, what he said and take his vengeance. Yeah, now, now it's going to happen. And, uh, and yet, I mean, I think Joseph goes so far after, you know, you might stand back and say, well, this, this was kind of a brutal uh, 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 method to kind of to test his brothers. And yet the desire to see, you know, where, what is, where is their heart at? Are these the same men who did those things? And he sees a transformation. And what a, what a glorious thing that is. And in God's mercy, uh, again, like he says, uh, don't be angry at yourselves because you might be angry at yourselves. Don't be distressed because you might feel distress. And he is so open and, and loving here that, uh, and accepting. And then, you know, giving gift upon gift. Go get dad, bring him down here. I know exactly where you're going to live. And uh, in fact, uh, uh, we'll just uh, uh, we'll read a couple of these verses here. Verse 16. Because uh, then Pharaoh, now remember, there's no Egyptians in the room. And in fact, that's probably a good idea, because maybe the Egyptians, if they saw all this, could report and say, these are the men with Joseph right now. They're his brothers, and they're the ones who sold him, left him, you know, uh, for dead. And uh, uh, they did hear him crying. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he was really weeping earlier in the chapter. Oh, oh, in, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 I mean, so they know something's up. Yeah. And even, I, this is marvelous, because, again, Pharaoh, not a believer, not a, uh, other than the, the witness of Joseph, maybe in his household, we, we talked about the language of one of his servants and, you know, how it said, your God, you know, it's all taken care of, don't worry about paying back uh, for, the, uh, for the, uh, the money that was in your sacks on the trip and stuff like that, but, uh, uh, you know, even Pharaoh, you know, the, the uh, not part of the covenant people, even Pharaoh is happy. When the report was heard in Pharaoh's house, Joseph's bro the Joseph's brothers have come. It pleased Pharaoh and his servants. Pharaoh said to Joseph, say to your brothers, do this. So Pharaoh's still the one in charge, right? But it's, you know, magnanimous and gracious 
to his, uh, uh, to his vice pharaoh, uh, load your beasts, go back up to the land of Canaan. So take what you need now, that's free gift. And uh, then grab your father, take your father and your households. That, not a huge number, but still a logistical challenge to come back after this, whatever, 150 mile trip, come back down with everybody. You're moving your entire household, pack up the moving van with these wagons. I will give you the best of the land of Egypt, and you shall eat the fat of the land. Fat of the land. Anybody know where that? I, I, I'm wondering if this is the first place. I didn't do a do a study on where that came from. If this is the reference to that, where uh, I always think of what is it? Of mice and men, uh, the Steinbeck novel, mm -hmm. and uh, 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 I can't remember the one. There's the big guy who doesn't have all of his wits about him, and Lenny. they keep on, uh, Lenny, and they keep on talking about, uh, you know, live off the fat of the land, you know, so this, you know, this, this marvelous, you know, mythical place that'll, you know, if we hang in there long enough, we'll, 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 we'll enjoy sort of a heaven on earth. But, uh, but even Pharaoh, you know, the, the enemy, the God, the, the one who is outside of God's people, even he is made to be generous. This is like, when the, when the people of Israel you know, escape from slavery. And what do the Egyptians do? They take off all their earrings and you know, their, their gold and stuff, and they, you know, the, the plunder of the Egyptians, and they give it. And now what do the, Egypt, what do the Israelites use it for later? Make a golden calf. <laughs> Make a golden calf. So, but, uh, uh, and you, Joseph, are commanded to say. So there's still the, the hierarchy here, but, but Joseph's joy is Pharaoh's joy. That's remarkable. Uh, do this. Take wagons. We talked about this is new technology. Wagons from the land of Egypt for your little ones and for your wives and bring your father and come. Have no concern for your goods for the best of all the land of Egypt is yours. This is still in the middle of a famine. Much worse up in Canaan. They've got food in uh, Egypt and Goshen's going to be okay. This is remarkable. This is, you know, when the boys went into the room to see Joseph just a, whatever 15 minutes ago before all this happened they're they're uh, they're all thinking uh, uh, what's Joseph going to do now you know we, uh, Benjamin had uh, the, the, the the cup that he shouldn't have had but now this it's pure grace and restoration and you know instead of death life and uh, full provision and preservation God is taking his care of his remnant, even though there's going to be, there's a lot more history that comes after this, and that's our story too, with slavery and captivity, and, and, uh, uh, and yet in the midst of all of this, even though we are not faithful, we are consistently not faithful, and yet in all of this, in all of it, God is faithful, and uh, we, we're the beneficiaries of the fulfillment of all of his promises, which is already working through Joseph. We'll stop there and pick up at uh, verse 21 next week. Let me turn off the...